of some kind, relax, you've entered my living room, um, and you're my guest, so thank you for coming, this is Joe's Records and Tapes, that's what we're calling it, I'm Joe Hagen, we're here at the uh, behest of Janklow and Nesbitt, my literary agency, thank you to them for uh, getting me involved in this craziness, and I'm happy to be here. We just heard, uh, of course, Chuck Berry. And uh, Memphis, Tennessee, a little bit of a uh, spiritual homage to um, our guest, Peter Goralnik, who's going to be coming on here in a little bit. I'm very excited about that. Personal hero of mine, kind of uh, his biographies, I say plural of Elvis. Of course, you probably know these. This is like on the, uh, whoops, <laughs> Mount Olympus of uh, American, not just music biographies, but just biographies. I mean, um, when I wrote my book, Sticky Fingers, you know, this was just like a, a shining light on the hill that I hope to achieve anything even close to it. And uh, Peter um, is somebody that I uh, have come to know a little bit. And uh, for that, I'm grateful, and I'm so glad that he's agreed to come on here. So we're going to do that in a little bit. I'm going to play a couple tracks for you. Um, that Chuck Berry uh, track comes from uh, this. Uh, it's going to be backwards on your screen, but it's Chuck Berry's uh, Golden Decade, which is like two of his albums compiled together. It's a fascinating uh, record. You can probably find this for like $5 in a record bin somewhere, but fascinating thing I just discovered yesterday some liner notes in here by one Marshall Paul. Marshall Paul. Never heard of this Marshall Paul. So I looked him up and uh, he doesn't exist really. It's the gnome de plume of Marshall Chess, who was the heir to the Chess Records fortune, son of Leonard. Um, and uh, I'm going to say that he was not a great liner note writer, but he's an interesting guy. He was a source in, a, you know, uh, somebody in my book, he told amazing stories about the Rolling Stones because when he got uh, lost his inheritance, when his father uh, suddenly died, he wasn't able to inherit the chess fortune. He instead helped Mick Jagger start Rolling Stones records and uh, became uh, kind of part of their druggy entourage in the 70s. And of course, he had fantastic stories about that. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, the reason I wanted to also bring up Chuck Berry, and I'm going to play a song very soon, but it's just to say that um, I met Chuck Berry in uh, 1988 when I was 17 years old. I was in high school, and uh, I went to a Veterans Day concert and um, snuck backstage. It was on a naval base, and I, went, I snuck into the officer's club looking for a bathroom, and there was a pickup band on a stage playing a bunch of rhythm and blues. And I thought, oh, they must be warming up. But I didn't recognize what band this was. 
And I said, hey, what are you guys doing here? And they said, oh, Chuck Berry's coming in here any minute now. We're his, like, pickup band. Because people that know about Chuck Berry, he's got pickup bands. And uh, so I just was like, I'm going to hide in the shadows and hang out here until Chuck Berry shows up. And then in comes Chuck Berry with this uh, beautiful, blonde, statuesque woman with a tray with, like, a pitcher of orange juice on it and two glasses. And she's just following him around and... uh, you know, when I wrote a paper about, I wrote a little uh, paper about this for my humanities class in high school, and I was like, oh, his wife was with him. It wasn't his wife, but uh, it was some kind of girlfriend. And uh, anyway, that made a huge impression on me, and I wrote about it for my humanities class, and the teacher was so struck by this, like, long story of me sneaking backstage and meeting Chuck, hanging out while he played. I pretended I was with his group, went right up backstage and watched the entire show from backstage, and then followed him all the way back to his car, and he had this giant Cadillac, and inside were, like, crumpled up cool cigarette packages and McDonald's ketchup packages and I was like oh he's just on the road in this Cadillac with this blonde driving around from show to show and it was a remarkable experience and it was basically like the beginning of me knowing I could maybe be a journalist I hadn't even thought of it it never occurred to me but that was sort of like wow Uh, it made a huge impression on me and um, and I just recently read that Peter had his own experience with Chuck Berry in 1967 probably a cooler time to have met Chuck Berry but um and, you know, uh, that's how my journalism career probably got started in the long run. It was, and then years later, I got to meet Peter. And, um, and the reason was is I called him up out of the blue to help me uh, on a kind of quixotic quest of my own to discover the world of Charlie Rich. And Charlie Rich was somebody that Peter wrote really eloquently and really wrote the definitive profiles of him in the 70s. And so I called uh, Charlie, I mean, I called Peter. Charlie Rich was dead. And uh, Peter uh, said, you need to get a hold of this woman in Memphis. He was very kind about the whole thing, totally. Oh, yeah, great, I'll help you. Uh, Put me in touch with a woman named Natalie Goldberg and uh, uh, Rosen, (laughs) Rosenberg, sorry. And uh, she, uh, it turned out, had produced this lost record that I was obsessed with in which uh, Charlie Rich was playing really soul music. He was playing like R&B of the kind that you would associate with, I don't know, Otis Redding or Ray Charles. And uh, and it had been produced by Natalie Rosenberg, this woman I'd never heard of. And so I got a hold of her. I went to Memphis and I went on this incredible adventure learning about Memphis rock and roll, about the history of Sun Records, everything about Charlie Rich, who was a troubled soul. And it was one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. And basically, I was sent on that journey by Peter Gronick. And uh, who could ask for anything more? I was in heaven. And so what I think I do is I'm going to play a song that Natalie uh, Rosenberg uh, produced uh, in 1966 for Charlie Rich. And uh, it's a great track. Um, And it was the track that got me uh, really excited about Charlie Rich and uh, ended up getting me in touch with the great Peter Goralnik, who's going to be coming on shortly. So stand by while I figure out whether I'm looking at the right track. Going to see whether I can do this. Can he do it? He did it. Have a listen. How you tempt me My heart beats faster but Not as fast as when I hear My lover's name Goodbye fame Oh, pass on by Gold, how you glitter Is any key goodbye go pass on by pass pass on by I, I won't cry just just that long just as long as she are here with me oh wine 
children filling So hard to resist But I can find the same thing Every time we kiss Goodbye wine Oh, oh pass on by Pass on by Charlie Rich, 1966, for High Records. Maybe some of you uh, record nerds will uh, recognize High Records as the label that all of the Al Green records that you love were on High. High was a Memphis label, amazing kind of weird history. I think, and Peter will correct me if I'm wrong, there was a guy named Bill Justice that was like a, maybe a, like the wingman, right-hand man to Sam Phillips at Sun Records in the 50s. I think he had something to do with high. Maybe he can tell me later. Um, so uh, from there, one thing I want to say is uh, last week we had Chris Blackwell on here. Chris Blackwell is an incredible legend. He started Island Records, as you recall. He's got this rum that I've been drinking on this show you know possibly to not be so nervous on in front of all these people but uh and it's a great it's great stuff but last week we talked about millie small who my boy lollipop everybody remember that old song my boy lollipop ba -bum -bum. okay first international jamaican hit of all time we talked about it last week and uh, i don't know if we took he mentioned it on the show but there's this wonderful story he tells about uh he had her record that song. He thought she could be a big hit. He was going to bring her to London from Jamaica. She never left the island. Her mother was terrified, and he had to call the mother and say, hey, is it okay to bring Millie to London? She never left Jamaica, and she didn't have a winter coat, and it was winter. And, uh, you know, um, Chris Blackwell's mother, who was this, like, grand dame of British society, said, oh, Millie, you can't go to London without a coat, and she gave her her own coat, and it was way too big. And so Millie, small shows up in London with this like oversized coat that uh, Chris Blackwell's mom gave to her. Well, unbelievably, Chris, um, and sadly, uh, Millie Small just died uh, this week. So, um, you know, let's drink one for Millie Small, my boy Lollipop. She's, uh, you know, her legacy is secure. You know, the first huge international Jamaican hit in the history of recorded music. And um, I was um, weird coincidence that we had Chris on here last week. So I'm going to bring on Peter in a moment. I'm going to play one more song. And uh, I'm going to do this as a kind of like uh, Peter Stump, Stump the Historian. I'm going to put this song on, and uh, when, when Peter comes on, we'll see if he knows uh, about this song, who it is, and where they're from. I think he'll know. But, you know, maybe not. Let's see, Peter. Okay. Uh, it's a great tune. I recently discovered it on a record that I think I paid a buck for. And uh, it was worth every dime uh, because this song was on it. Beautiful song. I'm going to need my flashlight and my glasses and maybe a microscope to figure out where exactly this needle should land. Do I feel your warm lips growing colder? Are you slipping? From my arms silently Am I winding up the same As the other love you name Just a page in your book of memory Has a flame in your heart burned to ashes 
yes, yes. Do you see me now as just your used to be? Though you've heard me, please confess. Am I like all the rest? Just a page in your book of memories. Just a face in a crowd. Your arms gathered. Just a name on a list that grows and grows. Just a sigh, just a kiss, just a thrill. Just a chapter that seems about to close. Have we come to the end? Oh. Our story. Are you playing the last scene now with me? Are my dreams turning to dust? Is my love for you just one more page in your book of memories? page in your book of memories that is an artist whose name I'm not going to reveal just yet but I'm now going to bring on our friend here I am going to invite and we're going to pray for a technological success comes all right I got to put my headphones on so I can hear you hello well, here I am. I'm just a page in your book of memories. You may. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it. To, uh, can you name the artist? No, you know, the thing is, I'm, I have in mind the song that I'm going to write, which is I've forgotten more than I ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I think that's actually, believe it or not, that's close to the lyrics of an Esther Phillips tune. Uh, I've, I've forgotten more than you'll ever know. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I ever knew. Now that's that's a variation, but I'm sure somebody's done it. You know. Well, that was uh, Percy Wiggins. Oh yeah, the brother of the great Spencer Wiggins. That's right, and they used to be Spencer and Percy. I had no but idea. I, that... I, say, I, I wouldn't have known that. I mean, I wouldn't. Have, I mean, other than having heard it before, I would not have known that, and I didn't. Yeah. Well, I feel honored to have stumped, uh, you know, my hero Peter Goralnik. Um Welcome to Joe's Records and Tapes. That's what we're calling this craziness. I appreciate you doing this. This is your first time on any kind of video contraption like this, and you're new to even to Instagram. So I feel like uh, very honored to be bringing you, or maybe ashamed and embarrassed to be bringing you into this uh, ridiculousness. But um, you know, in, in this age of social distancing, to join up at this time, right? Uh, I guess it's just the right moment to do it. It is... Absolutely. And I feel so um, great that we're going to connecting and there's other people that are coming in and they're going to hear and, and talk to us. Um, so you heard me telling that story about meeting Chuck Berry um, when I was 17. And that was like a huge thing for me. You know, it really, I didn't realize what it was until later, you know, it metastasized into, oh, I can go and sneak backstage and write about anybody. And I love music. And, you know, I think that maybe within a week I bought a guitar and I still play guitar to this day because it was so huge. It was an epic experience. Tell me about your own uh, story, maybe your Genesis story of like learning about music, knowing that you could write about it and loving it and having, you know, was there something similar? Well, I, and, and no, I mean, it's kind of a variation of it, I guess, because I, I always wanted to be a writer from the time I was a little kid. I had two great ambitions. You know, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a major league baseball player, and I did the very best I could with my abilities in both in both fields. But uh, he, but when I was um, fifteen or sixteen, 
I just fell into the blues. I mean, it was, I can't explain it. I can't name it. I can't tell you what it was that kindled me, but a friend of mine and I, a friend of mine named Bob, uh, named Bob Smith, his brother went to the Newport Folk Festival, came back with a whole bunch of records. Among them was some blues. And Bob and I just totally flipped over, you know, we heard uh, Big Bill Brunzi or Lead Belly or Lightning Hopkins, and we just, we just never turned back. And then a few years later, uh, when the underground press sort of started up, the Boston Phoenix started up, the voice was going strong. Crawdaddy had just begun, and this kid I knew, uh, I had known uh, from before Paul Williams started Crawdaddy when he was, I think, at Swarthmore. Anyway, this underground press started up, and people, and a couple of people asked me if I'd like to write for these publications. And I said, well, yeah, sure, but only about blues. I mean, Crawdaddy was not a blues magazine. It was about Grateful Dead, it was about Jefferson Airplane, it was about Moby Grape. But, uh, and so really, the reason that I did it, I was writing novels, I was writing short stories, I published a collection of short stories when I was 20, and another one a couple of years later. But it, the opportunity to write about these heroes of mine, to write about Muddy Waters, to write about Bo Diddley, to write about Jerry Lee Lewis, to write about Howlin' Wolf, James Brown, it was just something I wanted to tell the world about this. And there was no uh, outlet for, um, I mean, they were never mentioned in the mainstream press. They were never brought up in the mainstream media or in mainstream culture. So to be able to tell people about the James Brown show, that this was the greatest live theater I'd ever seen, that this was a happening beyond, happenings were very much in fashion. Now. This was a happening beyond anything that anybody could imagine. That was really the thing. And it was just, I, that, and that's, what has sustained me ever since was writing out of my enthusiasm for the music and trying to tell, tell people about this music that was so great to me. Well, um, you mentioned James Brown. Tell me about that. Tell me about your experience seeing him. Where did you see him? What was that like? Um, I'm, yeah, obviously, it probably made a huge impression. It had to be um, unbelievable. But. Well, the thing was, we, we kept waiting for him to come to Boston, and, and he never did, at least not to my knowledge. And uh, probably the first time I saw him live was in the Tammy show, uh, which opened uh, downtown in Boston on a, in a combat zone. And it was just like, it was just astonishing, because it was, it, we were huge fans of the music. But then to see him and to see him just take the show and to see him either after or before the Rolling Stones, but just obliterate everything in his path. Am I, am I hands just destroying the camera angle here? Uh, but anyway, so... You look beautiful. You're beautiful. <laughs> yeah, right. But anyway, so then, then uh, we went to this um, uh, wedding of a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, James Brown was playing that night in Providence, at the Providence Arena. And we went straight from the wedding. Uh, to the Providence Arena to see him. And, and, and I had gotten tickets. Uh, that was as close as he came to Boston. I had gotten tickets, so we were like in the 10th row, say. Well, I realized then that sitting on the floor when you go to a James Brown concert is not the place to be because it was great in the whole, you know, build up to James Brown. You've got a great view of the stage. As soon as the show started, it was just whoom, you know. So anyway, I ended up in the mezzanine. But it was just, it went on for maybe three you know, I don't know how many hours. James Brown was playing the organ when we walked in. But it was just the most absolutely astonishing show, and it continued to be that way. Just as, in fact, Jerry Lee Lewis's show, every time he saw it, it wasn't the, that kind of a, you know, big deal kind of uh, orchestra band, you know, all the accompanying acts. But the thing about James Brown, the thing about Jerry Lee, the thing about Howlin' Wolf, all of them, you just never knew what was coming next. James Brown may have known what was coming next, but you never knew in the audience. And it, it just it just completely blew me away and, and still does and did time after time after time. Right. Um, and uh, well, I remember, so when I was researching my uh, book on Rolling Stone magazine, uh, I started to see your name popping up doing blues reviews. Uh, maybe you did some concert reviews, but it was like, no, kind of, no just blues um, related pieces, right? Well, yeah, I mean, actually, the first thing I wrote, I think, was um, uh, from Elvis in Memphis, was a review of from Elvis in Memphis. But I did, you know, I did a profile of Johnny Shines, one of Muddy Waters. I think we were both out of my first book, I Feel Like Going Home. I did one on Charlie Rich. I mean, a, um, 
sort of a big, uh, maybe Saul and Burke was the first, first thing I did. But, uh, but anyway, it, it, uh, it, it was just writing about these things for which I had such enthusiasm. And I think John Landau was a record review editor. He may not have been the first right. editor, but, he, but so I just, I, I wrote about stuff I was crazy about. And kind right. Of <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I've always wondered, you know, ever since I read the, you know, your Elvis uh, biography, which was my introduction really to your name and work. And then I went back to read the other stuff. Feels like going home and feel like going home. I was wondering, did you see Elvis? Did you see him play? Yeah, in 71 at, at the Boston Garden, uh, seeing wow. 909 for Celtics games, but more, I think, for Elvis. Yeah. And it was great. It was, you know, but it was, it was a kind of a tableau by that time. I mean, he, he put everything into it. It wasn't, it wasn't like at the end. I mean, he, he, it was a lot, a lot of, um, won't fan it, I guess, but it wasn't like James Brown. I mean, I would have liked to have seen Elvis at the Eagle's Nest, uh, uh, you know, back in 1955 or something. I mean, or, or right. many places. I mean, all. But uh, but I'll never forget that that um, when he came back at the end. I mean, I think it was an encore. It was one of the last songs, and he did "Funny How Time Slips Away." And it was one moment when things just slowed down. Yeah. He, he stopped, and uh, James uh, Burton was playing dobro on that, I believe. And wow. and it was like you know he sang the he sang the line gotta go now and everybody's going no 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 don't go you know yeah <laughs> back some old day and so that to me was just uh, and it, and I loved seeing it I mean we went in on the subway and everybody there was going to the Elvis concert and it was sort of feeling a sense of commonality or just a community I guess that uh, you rarely got. Uh, or I really got anyway in those yeah. days, and so it was. It was the whole thing was kind of a thrill, but not a thrill that I particularly wanted to repeat. And I never was that interested in seeing him in Vegas or anything. So, uh, but but uh, anyway, I don't mean. I mean, it's not like I don't mean to be snobby about it or anything. But it was, it was cool. It was really cool. It was really cool. But it wasn't like James Brown. Right. Well, that wasn't his moment in the culture. You know, it was like an oldies act almost already. You know, he was a well, kind of kind of yeah. But you know, I did see Al Green when he was still Al Green with the E on the end, and he had the one record out, um, Back Up Train, and he opened for Aretha Franklin at a place that's now the Wang Center, but I think it was the music hall then. And during the intermission, he was out in the, um, this is Al Green with an E, Albert Green. He was out, uh, you know, in the lobby selling his records, wearing this sort of ice cream white suit. So that, that, was, that was my first exposure to Al Green. Wow. Yeah, and I, I have to imagine it was pretty uh, epic. Well, no, because he only had the one song, and he, I think he did it two or three times in the set. I mean, it was, it was cool and everything, but he was yeah. just the opening act for Aretha, you know. Right, wow. Well, and then Aretha, you mentioned her as like a, you know, a, an aside in that anecdote, but um, that must have been on its face kind of like unbelievable experience as well. But um, I've always wondered how you ended up writing an Elvis biography. I mean, you had so many sources in the world of Memphis, I, I take it, you know, you'd been for years knowing people in, yeah. you know, in that world. Maybe you knew some of the Memphis Mafia guys, I don't know, but oh, his entourage. I didn't know them until I, I mean, I became good, good, great friends with Jerry Schilling over the yep. course of writing the book, but I hadn't met any of them early on. I knew, I had met Scotty Moore, I had met a, you know, some of the musicians, but no, I, what happened was, um, I signed on to write the script for a documentary, which got made and which was fine, but uh, from which I took my leave. We had, it was, it was a one third, one third, one third, and two thirds of the way through, I took my leave. And I think by mutual agreement, we were both glad to be rid of each other. But in the course of doing it, um, I had an exposure. Remember, this is before the internet, before, it, it was before mass communication. It was in the days of the caveman and woman but uh, but so but i got this exposure for the first time in, in order to write the uh documentary to all these interviews elvis had done back in 55 56 um not so many in 57 i mean there were very few interviews but and i'm listening to him and i'm listening to him answer the questions and i'm thinking you know all of a sudden i'm thinking wait a minute you know i've written about about Elvis before. I've written about him from the outside. I've written to, I've sort of imposed my construct on what I think Elvis must 
have been or must have thought or must have been looking for. But man, this is somebody who could speak for himself. And that was when I got the idea of doing the biography. It was just the idea of trying to write something that was like the profiles that I'd written. I mean, the attempt, I'm not claiming the achievement, but the attempt was always to write from the inside out, not to write a thing from a great distance where I leaned back like this and I said, well, let me tell you about this or that. I wanted to, if I was looking at Waylon Jennings' world or Solomon Burks, I wanted to look at their world as much as I could. And it was it's limited how much you can from the inside out. And with Elvis, that was what I set out to do. And it was all really sparked by listening to Elvis in those early interviews and realizing how well he carried himself, how very, uh, artic not just articulate, but, but eloquent he was, and how inward looking he was at that stage. I mean, which are not, which was not the common, uh, tra the traits that were commonly attributed to him. So that, that was really what started me off. And, and I just tried to dig in deeper and deeper. And, and uh, this is why when I, uh, before I ever did the Sam Phillips, I said, this is the last biography I'm ever going to write because, you know, if you get out of a biography live, you're doing pretty well. I mean, it's just, it's all absorbing. And, and after doing these biographies for, I guess I started Elvis in 88, uh, beginning of 88, and Charlie Rich, I mean, um, Sam Phillips ended in 2015. So that was 27 years. And I thought, well, that's enough. <laughs> I can, I can attest to that biography uh, comment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and also, I also know from having written a biography that, you know, you go in with some rough thesis in your mind about what it might, you know, what the arc of it might mean or what if there's some sort of mm -hmm. cultural framework you're going to put around it. You go in with, like, biases, you know, basically, and then you, they, these get all tossed around and you come out the other end in a completely, sometimes a similar place, but not exactly. What was your... Did you have an initial thesis about Elvis, and what was your take on him culturally? No, I, I don't think I did have an initial thesis. I think my aim, and this takes a lot of discipline, was to set aside all preconceptions, because you're absolutely right. One tends to go in. If, if, you, if you're thinking of yourself, you may have all kinds of views. I mean, I may have all kinds of views. I'm not putting this on you. But what I tried to do was to set that aside and basically to deconstruct everything that I possibly approached so that even something like Albert Goldman's biography, which I think, you know, is utterly abhorrent, but I tried to look at it from the standpoint, not of where he's trying to create some sort of a sensation by, or he's, he's jumbling time in order to make a thematic point, but where did this come from? Where did that come from? And it wasn't all that much, but it was still, it was. It gave me some sense, some um, some way of, of of looking at it. But but really, I mean, I'll t I'll tell you a better example is with Sam Cooke. Um, I was writing about Sam Cooke uh, for Sweet Soul Music back in eighty one or eighty two or so, and I got in touch with J W Alexander, who had been his friend, his mentor, his um, uh, you know uh, business partner. Uh, just a great guy. He had, uh, managed the Pilgrim Travelers, sung with the Pilgrim Travelers, uh, played uh, semi-pro baseball. He was just a, fan, a wonderful guy. But I, mean, I didn't know him at all at the time. I learned, learned that he was a wonderful guy. And I went in with the idea that, you know, my Sam, the Sam Cooke, the 10 pages or so in Sweet Soul Music or however many, it was going to be the story of he gained the world but lost his soul. I mean, that was the common story. And after talking with uh, J.W., I mean, he was incredibly kind, incredibly generous, and we became friends from that moment on. We talked maybe for three, three and a half hours, and I realized nothing that I had assumed was true in the least. And from that moment, the moment that I met J.W. in 1982, uh, I knew I wanted to write a biography of Sam Cooke, throwing away everything I had ever thought about him. And I didn't write the book until I came out in 2005. And... Uh, so it took quite a while to gestate in, in a variety, I mean, for a variety of reasons. But what turned me around was just the idea that it's exactly what you said. I mean, my concept, without having thought about it too much, and there's that great Angelo, is it Angelo Bond? He gained the world but lost his soul. I forget, it's a great song. But um, 
you know, that was that was sort of, you know, my stupid dismissal of a very complex thing and just talking with JW. But, but the other thing that's funny, and I'm sure you have run into this too, is I did, I, up until then, I, I, I haven't taped all my interviews. For instance, I don't have a single word of Charlie Richards on tape, even though I spent a great deal of time with him and, and uh, you know, and uh, it was very meaningful. But I, by the time I did um, talk to JW, met JW, I was taping almost all the interviews. It took me 20 years to understand what it was J.W. had been saying to me in 82 because he threw out so many things. There were so many references. If I had been taking notes, I couldn't have written them down because I had no idea what he was talking about. He was throwing out names. So-and-so was the vice president of BMI and we got a three for two deal and blah, blah, blah. And so, uh, but I literally, I, when I came to write the book, which was probably started around 2000, 2001 or something, that interview remained the, found, the foundation of the book the interview I'd done 20 years before, but something I could never have understood at the time. And if I hadn't had it on tape and if I didn't have a transcription of it, I would never have been able to have understood it in its, you know, fullness. Yeah, that, that's happened to me exactly where I did an interview like five years ago in which the person was talking in such series of fragments and throwing out things they thought I knew what they were talking about, very little of which I knew. And then later on, after I'd done a lot of research and looked at the transcript again, it was almost like a, a skeleton key of the entire story, you know? Well, yeah, and, and, but you never want to, the point is you don't want to stop somebody. It's like, you don't want to go to an interview with Johnny Cash and he says, well, now when June and I did this, you want to stop, well, wait a minute, excuse me, excuse me, yeah. Mr. Cash, uh, who is this June you're talking about? It, it right. attempts to kill the interview. <laughs> right, I never, I do, I, I'm of the same mind, just let it roll and figure it out later, right? Because like um, when there's a flow going, you know. Right, right, exactly. So, you know, I want to just say that, you know, when I think of your book, uh, the Elvis biographies in particular, um, and I, you know, everybody has an opinion of which one they like better, like which period they like to read about, you know. And I'm a big fan of Carolus Love. I just, I, I love the kind of like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for the tragedy uh, side of the, of the story. But there's a whole sequence where um, Elvis and his entourage of uh, Memphis Mafia guys, they're all kind of like, um, you know, uh, you know, Peter Pan's, you know, they haven't grown up basically. And, and, P and Elvis buys them all these ranches, these interlocking ranches, you know, where they're all on the horses together. And there's another period where he decides he's going to build a double decker bus with portholes on it. And he drives around and they're taking speed and just having these road trips that are insane. And I, I remember just thinking, this is like, um, there's only going to be one story like Elvis's because he was the beginning of that level of fame and the kind of mythic American story of somebody who becomes trapped in their own success and they can't evolve, they can't grow. And he attempts to grow in these sort of fits and starts ways with like his hairdresser being his spiritual advisor and all these ways. And I mean, Maybe you were so in the details. I mean, the book is so rich because by the time you, you get so committed to, the, to him mm -hmm. through the depth and length of it, that by the time he dies and you know he's going to, you're just crushed. You know, you're just crushed because you've been following him like basically day by day, it seems like practically, you know? See, see I did everything I could to divert, to divert you from re remembering that he was going to die. <laughs> I threw every, everything up there. It's so powerful and... I, every time, when, the thing I took away from it was just how, what a American myth it is, you know, like what a mythic Greek tragedy it is. And, um, you know, I'm sure you, it sort of, uh, I know as a biographer, you know, you're so into the story, you're so down the rabbit hole, and you can come to certain moments where you, it, the Christmas tree lights up for you and you realize the story you're writing. Did you have any moments like that where it really just you understood what you were writing for the first time out of all of the details that you'd been buried in? I think with each of the books, and actually to some extent with each of the profiles, you try to, it, it, it's kind of the way Elvis worked his way into a song. I mean, unlike somebody like Jerry Lee Lewis, who just every time he approaches a song, it's a brand new thing, same song, you know, but a brand new. But Elvis 
worked his way into it and dug deeper and deeper and deeper. So he might repeat the same verse over and over and over again. You listen to his Merry Christmas Baby, for instance, which goes on for six or seven minutes, or you listen to Stranger in My Own Hometown, and the same verse keeps coming back, but he's trying to push it each harder each time. And so I just try to sort of dig my way in, and I think, yeah, there is that moment of revelation. I mean, I can't say when it comes exactly, but it's not a moment of revelation so much as a moment of feeling like you're one with the story, like you understand uh, it would be with Sam Cooke. I mean, you sort of feel like his world, and I mean, I don't mean this arrogantly or anything because it can never be true, but, but his world is your world. Or, and, and, you know, and the other thing is it, it's familiarizing yourself. So let's say with Sam Cooke, where I spent so much time with J.W. Alexander, with Bobby Womack, with Sam's brother, L.C., um, you know, with just a bunch of just amazing people. And, but spent time and time and time with them. And in a sense, after a while, it became, and they all t told, uh, this was not as true of Elvis. With Sam Cooke, it was almost an eidetic experience. Everyone who told a story about Sam, uh, his wife, Barbara, JW, uh, LC, um, had, uh, Bobby, they're not at all the same person and they didn't all necessarily like each other. But when they spoke in Sam's voice, it came out identically, exactly the same. So that's how, you know, you try to, but you also try to get in through the research and through reading these things and to sort of understand the, uh, the context of the thing. So that something like from Elvis and Memphis, you know, the uh, 1969 uh, sessions at American, the Chips Mullen produced. I mean, I had written about it for Rolling Stone from the outside and just, you know, hailed it as a revelation, embraced it totally, you know, talked about how I'll hold you in my heart till I can hold you in my arms, the Eddie Arnold song. That was an example of another song where Elvis just got into it, boom, boom, boom. But, uh, but then when I wrote about it in the biography, it was irrelevant. The, the, the album had zero to do with it because the album was just an accident. The music was really what it had to do with and trying to understand the, and trying to grasp what the context was, how it had come about and how the music came about in the sessions. That became the entire drive and that gave it a completely different flavor than, uh, you know, the, and it gave me a different perspective than the person who had written the, the review of an album that was so cataclysmic for me. But that wasn't what the real story was, at least not in terms of the biography. Were you, uh, you know, at the end of it, um, did you like Elvis? Yeah, no, I love the people I write about, but, but by saying that, I'm not either saying I'm condoning or condemning. I, yeah. My, my, I mean, I wouldn't write about, I wouldn't write about somebody I didn't, I didn't like. And, and, you know, if you say, well, are there things that you discovered that you didn't like? Well, sure. I mean, but, you know, uh, I've discovered a lot of things about myself I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that, uh, yeah, this is like, to me, uh, I mean, there were some things that upset me uh, occasionally about all the people I, I've written about. But like I say, they, would, they might be upset if they were looking at, into, my, into my life at uh, some of the things I've done. But it's like what the, my mantra is. Donnie Fritz said to me, what I mean, the great songwriter, Donnie Fritz, a wonderful guy, Alabama leading man. And um, I was with him one time and we, I, we were talking about something and he said, oh, that's disgusting. And then he, there was a pause. And then he says, that's human. And that's really the attitude that maybe I always have, but I've definitely come to adopt is people don't do things that aren't human. So, you don't want to write about somebody by whom you're absolutely repulsed or, you know, that you feel has abandoned all moral codes or, or even more. I mean, I don't mean to be relevant to the present time, even more a person who can, is incapable of feeling shame. That's right. something I want to write about. Right. But, but, but the point is that when people, good people essentially do bad things, it's, they're not doing inh inhuman things. They're doing things that, you know, they're human things, and that doesn't mean you're saying they're good, but they're not. Anyway, that, that, that so no, I, I, I uh, and the thing with Elvis, one of the biggest surprises to me, or one of the biggest revelations, uh, was as a kid, everything, my whole, I discovered Elvis through the blues, 
and it was I didn't hear Mystery Train and That's All Right and um, uh, Good Rockin' Tonight, you know, all the sun, those sunsides until Elvis was in the army and they put out a couple of albums that had the sunsides on them. I just hadn't heard them. And I knew the blues things by then. I knew little Junior Parker. I knew Arthur Crudup. I knew Wynoni Harris. And it wasn't that I was looking for somebody to replace them. It was just I recognized, to me, Elvis was a great blues singer. And that's what sold me on him. So from that point on, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, he's a great blues singer. Well, why is he doing these songs? He should be doing blues. And in doing a biography, I really what astonished me was that I think Elvis is period, great, greatest period of creative achievement ferment was in the years after he got out of the army. And I know John Lennon said, oh, he was dead after, you know, the, after the army was dead or the army killed him or something. Like that. Right. But, but I, the singing that he does on those ballads by Don Robertson and Doc Thomas and Watt Schumann and the, the, his abilities as a, um, an interpretive singer or a song like I Need Somebody to Lean On that he did in Viva Las Vegas, which is kind of a dreamscape in the movie. They're just amazing songs, and he was at the peak of his powers. So to me, it's like there's that, and then from 67 to 60 to 70 or something, there's a second renaissance. And, you know, so it's kind of like I saw a much broader framework than I had ever imagined as a kid. And, that, and as a kid, I would have said, oh, God, what do you listen to that shit for? Right. Well, I was going to say that my personal favorite, Elvis record, and you don't really think of Elvis records per se, because he didn't make whole record, you know, uh, productions necessarily. Reading your book, I realized that they were Colonel Parker kind of like, you know, publishing schemes more than anything in some cases. But this is my favorite record. This, uh, you know, that's yeah. the way it is. Right, right, right. Well, so, so you must like the, you must like the movie. Then. I love the movie. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's amazing to look at when Sammy Davis Jr. comes backstage to see him and just that kind of era in in Vegas. But his commitment in these songs. Oh, it's is yeah. it's it's total in some cases. I mean, he is sometimes occasionally. I wanted to talk to you about this when he's performing. He sometimes is almost overwhelmed by how much committed he is to it, and he has to throw in a joke to almost like dampen the feeling or something. You know, he does that Righteous Brothers tune on here. You lost that loving feeling, and then he throws in this like ridiculous joke about his suit being too tight, right? Because he's you know right, right. What's joke, like Carrying self-effacement a little too far, or just right. not, not, yeah, no, no, it is, uh, you're right, you're right. But, but I mean, really, the, the ultimate example of that is uh, right at the end of his life, when he does Unchained Melody, it's in, uh, you know, in 77, it was towards, towards the very, one of the last concerts. And when he hits, that, I mean, it's, it's a, a moment of sort of beautiful ugliness or ugly beauty or something. I mean, just this, I can't describe what it is, but I mean, the point is he is just, struggling so hard and he's putting out so much and when he hits that final note and it isn't ghosted it's just it, it's an amazing thing and every it's heartbreaking time. it's heartbreaking yeah i mean it's it reminds me of the late billy holiday record you know the one she did on columbia that was hmm. she's at past her prime but you can just it's all tragedy just rec on recorded tape you know it's just amazing and the the effort and the commitment is still there and the the instrument is failing and then those the tension between those is there's something yeah. incredibly beautiful um so one thing i uh, to switch to sam cook i'm just you know i'm just now reading that book and i'm still in the uh period of he's in the church period but um and i love the soul stirrers the group he was in i mean amazing stuff any day now that tune any day now if you're out there google up any day now soul stirrers holy moly if you want to hear a mind blower, um, the voice that can go from and you go way up. I mean, he's the range of Sam Cooke is incredible. Um, but I also was reading some articles, you know, there's all these theories about uh, his end. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've contended with this uh, plenty, but he, you know, there's one story of how he died uh, that on its face just seems kind of pathetic and horrible. Um, you know, he comes back from a bar with a gal at a motel and she runs away with his pants. He runs out and the motel manager shoots him in the office. Okay. If you want to go look that up, people viewing, you can go look it up. But, but then there's all these alternative theories about like what actually happened. 
and because the woman that he was with had been a prostitute, and the woman that was uh, running the motel might have been a madam, and there's some theory that he might have been set up, right? Did you ever kind of conclude anything? Did you go around those different avenues and conclude anything about what, was it just what it looked like? Yeah, or, I mean, I, I went into it in quite a bit of detail in the book, and I think it was pretty much what it looked like. I mean, there's always going to be conspiracy theories about everything, and you can't ever prove a negative. There's no, you right. can't do that. And nor can you dispel a rumor or, you know, the kind of... But, um, no, I think that it's fairly uh, logical what happened, and uh, it, it, if it was a plot, it was a plot that done by a mastermind who had to have foresight to the extent of knowing exactly where Sam was going to be in a totally unpredictable evening. I mean, you can see what he did over the course of the night, how he right. met the, bar of the restaurant. He was with his uh, uh, engineer, Al Schmidt, and, um, and, Joan, and Al's wife, Joan Du. But, and they went to the Hacienda, which was a common place for musicians to go. I mean, up until I got into it, I thought, oh, why would you go to a CD motel like that? But they all went there. They stayed there, many of the musicians that came to town. They, it, Sam had acts of his, like the Sim twi Sims Twins, who played at clubs in the neighborhood. So um, that was all fairly logical. But really, what was most logical what, of all, and I hate to give this away, so if somebody hasn't read the book, don't listen. But um, it was really embedded in Sam's character. And you can see over the course of this, the book, this, you know, Sam's life, you can see three or four times before this when he became so enraged and went so far beyond, uh, you know, just what, uh, where, what he should have done, that it would have been far more likely that he would have been killed in those situations than he was in this. But I think he was so enraged that this woman runs off with his pants, which appeared to be her, you know, M.O., uh, trusting that he was so drunk and would be so embarrassed he would never come after her. And, um, but his father, uh, Sam's father had taught all of his kids, and it was eight kids, uh, never allow yourself to be disrespected. It doesn't matter. Don't ever let anybody, you know, disrespect you, and you go after them if they do, no matter who they are. So, it, but, but I mean, but Sam carried it to an extreme, and even his brother Charles, who sort of styled himself as the original gangster, and he, and he was, and he spent a fair amount of time in jail, and he was a tough guy. But he had to he had to call Sam off. Uh, for instance, when when they were arrested in Shreveport, he said, "Sam, they're going to kill you. They are going to kill you here." When Sam just would not let it go, and that's really what a change is going to come came out of. But he got he got arrested after being turned away from the uh, uh, hotel or the motel where he had reservations, which oddly enough was a, was a Holiday Inn, which was the first chain to be integrated in the South. So I don't know why it happened, but that is what happened. And he just would not let it go. And it's, it, that would have been another occasion when he could easily have been killed because his anger wouldn't let him let it go. Wow. That is, uh, I, I wasn't aware of, that's the, the genesis of that song. Oh, yeah, um, well, I, one of the, I mean, hearing uh, Blowing in the Wind, which J.W. had given uh, Sam the uh, Dylan album, and um, that was a tremendous influence. And I think the March on Washington, but the, uh, he wrote um, he wrote a change is going to come just uh, maybe weeks or uh, af after the incident in Shreveport, which made a tremendous mark on him. I think. Right. Um, so uh, this is the point when I want to start. Uh, we're going to we've got about um, yeah, about seven or eight minutes left in this recording, and I want to dedicate it to talking about Charlie Rich for a minute. Sure. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I called you up one day asking about Charlie Rich, and I knew you, I'd, read, I'd read your stuff, and uh, I was obsessed with that point. I know you know this feeling, like you're just, you get involved in some recordings, and you just, it becomes your muse for some kind of, like, madness that you have to pursue, and that's where I was at that moment, and you I had to know more about... Pass on by. What's that? I thought you were not going to pass on by. I was not going to have exactly right. And uh, I just didn't know anything about it. And I went on this whole journey to discover who he was. And he was, you know, this real kind of, uh, in many ways, a tragic character himself, although he, you know, got through some passages, but he had, what fascinated me most about it was that his wife, Margaret Ann was sort of his, you know, 
they had this real volatile love hate relationship, but she was a part of his creative life. You know, she wrote songs for him big time. And, um, you know, just I'll only note there's this, my favorite anecdote is when he goes into Sun Records or she goes in with a tape initially and gets him a audition with Bill Justice, I think. And, um, you know, uh, he hears all of Charlie Rich's jazz piano stylings and, you know, hands him the Jerry Lee Lewis album or whatever and says, when you get this bad, come back. And I don't know if that's an apocryphal uh, anecdote, but it's hilarious. But like you got to know him and you also recorded his last record mm. pretty much. Yeah. Which is an amazing thing. And I thought I read somewhere, but I don't know the story that he actually sang or wrote or recorded a song inspired by you. Is that right? Well, or something you said? No, what it, what it was, was that <clears throat> uh, when I, uh, just as uh, Behind Closed Doors was breaking in 73 and nobody had any idea it was breaking and Charlie was doing a showcase tour of these little clubs, like a little club in Pittsburgh and one in Worcester, Mass, I think, and they're funny places. And he was playing Max's Kansas City and I went down to see him down there. And he says, um, you know, and, and uh, he had this band, uh, uh, John used to be I think it was John used to be cool, Vanderpool. Somebody used to be cool, Vanderpool. And uh, I was really a young band from Arkansas. They, they were great. And uh, Charlie said, man, I got a surprise for you. And um, so uh, I said, oh, yeah, I love surprises, which was not, no, I'm just kidding. I, not. But he said, I got the surprise for you. I really want you to hear this thing. And um, it turned out it was a surprise to the band, too. But he played Feel Like Going Home, which he had just written. And he said that, uh, you know, it, he had read the book, which he was one of the, yeah, I'd written about him. He was one of the chapters, one of the profiles in the book. And he had read the book and told me when, after he had read it, I thought that was going to be the end of it. I, I loved Charlie and Margaret Ann. When I met them in 70, they were just two of the greatest people. They were people I wanted to be friendly with for the rest of my life. But I felt like, you know, I had to tell a true story. And if you read the chapter now, you laugh at me for my thinking that this could be off-putting to anybody in today in this age, but it, you know, it was telling a story about uh, his alcoholism, his depression, or his what really what amounted to this agoraphobia, where he just couldn't stand to be in crowds. And I wrote it, and I thought, well, that's the end of this beautiful friendship that might have been. And then after the book came out, and I heard from him. And he said, you know, it was hard, but it was the truth. And, you know, that was what was important. So anyway, in 73, he, he plays the song, Feel Like Going Home. And he says, you know, I wrote this from the feeling I got from reading your book. And uh, so it, it, it was like one of the greatest compliments. I can't imagine a higher compliment. And it was such a thrill. I'm like, uh, wow, no, I'm going to have to absorb that one because it's one of my favorite songs. And there's a whole scene in another magazine article, I think it was in like, another, I can't remember what magazine it was, where he goes into a pizza joint and he's really drunk and he just plays that song over and over and over again on the jukebox. Because, you know, he'd get in these like depressive, morose sort of states. And uh, anyway, I mentioned that in my article, which was published in the Oxford American. You can go look it up. It's, uh, you know, it was an a, important thing for me to write. But um, so... What's going to happen with uh, his last record that you recorded? It came out on CD in the 1990s, and then he died um, sort of out of the blue. He wasn't in the greatest of health, but can, will we uh, – tell us it's pictures and portraits, right? Um, pictures and paintings. Pictures and paintings, sorry. Yeah, will we see that record again, uh, you know, produced by Peter Goralnik? I mean, in addition to it being a great biographer. Produced by Scott Billington. I brought in and who just did a fantastic job. And Joe McEwen and I, uh, Joe, Joe bought the record for Sire and, and he and I were involved in it and, and Scott produced it. But it was, uh, it was such a cool thing. And it was, a, I mean, it was, came out on Sire and uh, I hope somebody, uh, I, I think it's out of print now, but it was in print for years and years. And uh, I'm, sure I'm going to attempt to uh, revive that album. That's going to be a mission of mine. We have exactly 10 seconds left and we're going to be cut off. Peter, thank you for coming on this program. I am so excited that you came.